Hello and welcome back to episode 30 of the Boxing Social Podcast in association with Betfred. With me, your host, Rob Tebbett. As always, before we get started, I'd just like to remind everybody to please like, follow and subscribe. Turn on those notifications for more boxing content. Now that's out of the way, I am delighted to be joined by Andy Clark. You all know him from the TV or you all know him from the sounds on the TV. Uh, how are you, Andy? Nice to see you. Good, yeah. Good. Very well, thanks. Good. Well, it's always a pleasure to be joined by you. We've got a lot to get through today, so let's get cracking uh, before we come on to this weekend. Of course, let's talk about what happened last weekend. Uh, pretty shocking turn of events in Sheffield. Kid Galahad losing his IBF featherweight title in dramatic circumstances against Kiko Martinez. Uh were you as shocked as I was? I was. I wasn't as down on the fight as a lot of people seem to be. I thought that it was. I thought that it was fine for a for a first event. Everybody knows when you win a title, you take a voluntary first up, and you you don't pick someone who you think is going to beat you. So they clearly didn't think it was going to happen. But I thought, as an opponent, I thought Martinez was was solid. I thought that was a there was nothing wrong with that. But I definitely didn't expect him to win. Um, I saw his fight against Alpha Barrett where I thought he was good. I thought he deserved to get the decision, but that's obviously upper weight. That was a, a super featherweight. So I was surprised because not so much by what Martinez brought because he's he's very consistent, he's very dedicated and he doesn't really have many off nights. But I just didn't think that that would happen to Galahad because he's worked long and hard to get that world title. It's been quite a rough road at times. He had the he had the drug ban, which was long, two years knocked down to 18 months. And most people would say that that is an appropriate length of ban, but it's not the ban that people normally get. Mm. So he's had to go through a lot to get to that world title level. He's 31 and he would have known. And having listened to things with him, he absolutely knows how fickle and difficult boxing can be and that no one's ever going to give him a voluntary. Therefore, he needs to hold on to that to that belt because he maybe hasn't really got time to work his way back into mandatory. So all of those things combined, I just thought that there was no way that that would happen. But then you can always get caught, can't you? You can always get caught. And he did get caught. And Darren called it perfectly, Darren Barker. And there's just nothing like a knockout, is there? There's just nothing, there's nothing like it. And... The scenes when one is scored, and I mean a proper knockout, mm. you know, not a stoppage or a TKO, a proper knockout. And the drama of it is is, is like nothing else. And and it was like that again on Saturday. And you've got one fighter going crazy because he's just made another dream come true. And you've got another one whose world is in tatters, their professional boxing world anyway. And they're just a few feet away from each other, sharing the same space, but just worlds apart. You know, it's... It's one of the reasons why we watch it. Um, so, yeah, to describe it as dramatic would be would be an understatement. And it's going to be difficult for him, I think. Now he's got the he's got a rematch clause, hasn't he? Because yeah. it was a voluntary. But is it difficult for him to make the weight? It didn't seem like it was too difficult when he beat Jazza Dickens. But you don't really know, do you? Unless you're right on the inside of it. Mm. And also, he had like the 18 months out of the ring as well before he boxed Jazza Dickens. You could you could imagine if you were very, very tight at the weight, it may have been that period of time where you've not been. Obviously, we all know that Barry Galahad is is kind of a gym rat. He's up, he's living in the gym all the time, but he's not making championship weight at those times. So you'd feel that that would have been the time where he may have struggled at the weight. Um, obviously, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing, particularly in boxing, where you get people afterwards saying so tight of the way and maybe he needs to move up. I know Tony Bellew was um, was very vocal on that after the fight. But I think, as you mentioned, Darren Barker called, I think, a round or two before with Galahad just pulling back in straight lines with his chin in the air a little bit. And what happened was is he got caught by whatever you think of Kiko Martinez. I was one of the people who I didn't think it was a very competitive fight at all, which I don't think it really was until he landed that right hand. But he got caught by somebody who can really punch. He can still punch. Martinez has always been able to punch at super bantamweight, at featherweight, obviously less so at super feather, but he gave a very good account of himself against Zelfa Barrett. I thought he won that fight. But as you say, those shots, when they come out of nowhere, it, it really is like nothing else in the sport. I felt like Galahad was was kind of in cruise control. Maybe that was the problem. Uh, I'm not really one to, to kind of look back and look at weight and things like that, particularly for something like that. I feel like... He got caught on the button and it was bang on the chin, the shot that caught him by somebody who can punch a little bit. So, yeah, I think um, 
a massive, massive shock. And for somebody like Kiko Martinez, who has kind of gone his whole career doing things as the away fighter, going the hard route, having the hard fights, just when you think he's done, he comes back and he gives another performance and another win. He's now a two-weight world champion. He's 35 years of age now, I think. And he's he's in a position now where he can kind of, obviously he's got the rematch clause with, with Galahad, but he can really kind of, you know, he's made something fantastic out of his career now. And it's, so, it's something that can only really happen in, in boxing, I feel, where somebody can be so on the way out and then all of a sudden the fight's over. And if you think about the fight, it was, it was about 10 seconds worth. It was sort of, 15 seconds before the end of the fifth and then five seconds into the sixth round. That's all he really won in the entire fight. And yet he's a new world champion. It was unbelievable. And it was um, a devastating loss, as you say, for Barry, considering the way that he's gone. The Warrington fight where he felt that he he deserved a decision, uh, didn't get it, of course. And now he's... um. He's now an ex-world champion. It was just... I'm still quite shocked now. I think this is the first time I've really spoken about the fight properly since it happened, and I'm still shocked about it now. He has to get that title back. He has to. I really didn't see this coming either, like I said. And, and the way his career's gone, as I, as I outlined it, he has to win the rematch. It's as simple as that, because this is where you make your money as, as a champion. And he will have made some decent money for that, for that first defence, but he was then looking at unifications and I think most people felt that he was capable of certainly giving any of the other champions a really good fight so he's got to win that rematch if the weight's difficult then then the weight's difficult but unless it's impossible that's what he's going to have to do mm. so if we do see him move up and it'll be because it is literally impossible or not medically safe for him to to do it any longer because if he moves up to super featherweight he's kind of starting again He's not a big ticket seller. He's not a big name. He's kind of dined out on this. You know, I, I don't know how well you know Barry. I, I certainly don't profess to know him massively well. But away from the cameras, I've always found him quite a pleasant guy, a very you know funny guy. Not always the the type of person that we see sometimes on the camera, where he kind of plays the villain a little bit, and he he kind of makes no bones about the fact that he's not always the most liked fighter. Moving up to super featherweight, as you say, he's going to have to start again. How is he going to get the momentum and get up to world level? Awkward style, not a particularly big name. As you say, he's going to have to start again. So he's going to have to really take the rematch because otherwise, what else is he going to do? Quite. There is there is no real other option for him. He's, he's going to have to he's going to have to do it. And like you, I'm never really interested in post fight explanations for defeats. Mm. Not that they've made any excuses, but whether it's an injury or whether it's illness or whether it's the weight, then you know if it was that big a problem, then you shouldn't have been fighting. And, you know, it's a fairly kind of cut and dried, brutal way of looking at things. But that's just that's just the reality. Um, we haven't heard any excuses. I don't think we will. And he's just got to take that rematch and win it. And, and there's, there's an enormous amount riding on it for him for, for all the reasons you just you just mentioned there. Um, it, it kind of, in a way, it, it reminded me a bit of Chisora Takam. Do you remember that fight? Like, yeah. totally different circumstances, but just in the way that it finished and that Takam was winning that fight. And then Chisora knocked him down and then just stepped across the ring and knocked him out. And at the start of that round, the way Martinez, they, they just got a sense about things, fighters, haven't they, I guess? And he must have just looked at him and just thought, you haven't recovered. You're going. Or I don't really care whether you have or you haven't, but I'm not going to kind of... You know, often you'll hear Corner say in that situation, you know, he's hurt, you know, he's hurt. Don't don't rush your work. There's no need to do this. No need. Step straight across the ring and just slammed it straight away. Um, and that was what made it so dramatic because the bell had barely gone. Mm. Um, and people are thinking, is he got, is a minute between rounds long enough? Is this going to happen? Is that going to happen? What's he going to do? And then it was over. Yeah, it, it was really like there's the photo of Eddie kind of looking down at his phone. I think he he mentioned it in an interview with with, uh, with Ryan, sorry, afterwards where he would sort of said, I was just going down to say, oh, what a dramatic round. Can he survive? And then I heard this, ooh, and then I looked up and the fight was over. Yeah, um, You make a good point there because you often do get trainers say, you know, don't rush your work, don't fall in. He's hurt. Just, just pick your shot again and find your shot. Sometimes the good old fashioned way of just walking over to the, the ring and, and walking to the across the ring to your opponent and letting the big shot go again. And that's obviously saw that he wasn't recovered. He tried to take that little half step back and his legs just didn't go anywhere. His legs kind of buckled, his chin stayed perfect. And he, as you mentioned, it wasn't a it wasn't a stoppage. It was a 
brutal knockout. And you have to wonder how that psychologically, considering all the things we've discussed for his career, how that could affect him going into this fight. I never see, I know he'd been down before, but a flash knockdown in 2012, he was put down. Jason Booth, he was down for, uh, I think he was given a count, as we would call it, as opposed to, you know, a real knockdown. But I've never really seen him hurt. I've never really seen him hit flush that often in recent years. And to go from not really being hit and to be this kind of fiddly, awkward character to getting you know, laid out, how that is going to affect him moving forward is going to be really, really interesting. It always is because I can't even imagine what that does to your confidence. Mm. Um, and it's not something they would ever really admit to because... You can't, but it, it, it has to do something to you. There's just no way that it doesn't. And if you go straight into an immediate rematch, we talked about this endlessly, didn't we? Everybody after Joshua got beaten by Ruiz, going straight into a rematch against somebody who's who's knocked you out. And you look back through boxing history and it hadn't happened very much. People hadn't been successful very often. Floyd Patterson did it. Lennox Lewis did it. Um Zael Graziano were three knockouts out of three fights, so that was a similar kind of equation there. But it's really rare because, generally speaking, you don't take an immediate rematch against someone who's just cleaned you out. Mm. But he's going to have to for the same reason that Joshua had to. There was there was no other choice. He's got a lot of long, hard nights of the soul ahead of him, and and it's a subject that I've always found really, really interesting. Is is how do you try and repair that self confidence? because there are just so many aspects to it. I mean, fighters are not scared of getting hurt. We, we, we know that. They, they're just not. They wouldn't be in there if they were. What they're scared of is losing. And what they're scared of is, is losing in a way which is just completely unambiguous. If you lose on points, I remember Froch saying to me once, talking about his record, and he's lost two fights, obviously, to Kessler and Andre Ward, both on points. Kessler really close. Ward, actually, when you look at the scores, was close. Mm. It wasn't really, but mm. but it was actually mm. because of the, what the judges returned. And the way he described it to me was, I lost two fights, fine. That's on my record. That happened. But they weren't defeats. No, no one ever defeated me. A knockout is a defeat. Like, you have been, you have been comprehensively defeated and there's really nothing you can say about it. I don't know how you how you kind of shrug it off because you've got to try and explain it to yourself somehow. And, and maybe in his head, what it will be is that although he prepared in the same way that he always does and was as professional as he always is, I don't think they'll hold up the weight. They can't if they're going to take the rematch mm. because that would be, that would be problematic psychologically. I think what he might go for is the idea that that little bit of fear that you need in the pit of your stomach just wasn't quite there, that he didn't think that Martinez could beat him. And that might translate into 0.1% of complacency. And that can be enough. But you've got to try and come up with something. Because otherwise, when the bell goes the next time, you look across the ring and there he is again. You know what he's done. He knows what he's done. And he's just going to be super confident that you're going to do it, that you can do it again. Yeah, and the, I mean, you look at back at the fight. I watch the fight back, as I often do when there's a shocking result. I watch the fight back pretty much immediately afterwards. I was also trying to stay awake until the middle of the night, which we'll come on to uh, shortly. But he was in full control. Certainly the early rounds. The first two rounds were as dominant as you really can be. Galahad hurt him with that southpaw left hand, which made Martinez do that little stutter step in the first round. The second round, he poured it on again, and it kind of looked to me like he was just going to continue to just turn the screw, turn the screw, similar to what he did with Jazza Dickens, where the longer the fight went, the more relentless he was. You just, just, Barry's not a, he's not the type of fighter. You never really see him kind of go to 100 miles an hour. It's always very... He's always nice and compact and it's very methodical and he kind of goes through the gears slowly and grinds you down and grinds you down. But it felt like to me, those rounds three and four, he just dialed it back a little bit. I felt like he felt the job was kind of done. Um, obviously, he'll know far better than me what he was thinking at the time, but I do feel like it was more what you've said there about him just not feeling like Martinez was capable. The instructions in the corner, kind of what we were just saying earlier from Dominic Ingle were, he's not ready to go yet take your time with him, do this, pick him apart, blah, 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 blah. Um, 
And he just left his chin there a couple of times, as Darren Barker mentioned in the commentary, but obviously wasn't punished initially, and then paid the ultimate price. And it was obviously not nice to see, but those kind of emphatic endings in boxing, there really is nothing like it. It is so visceral and it is so conclusive that it is that much more shocking when something like that happens. It was it was unbelievable. And, and for somebody like Kiko Martinez, who now kind of, obviously stakes the claim as a, the greatest Spanish fighter of all time. It's, it is a great story for somebody like him who's come over and, you know, given such a great account of himself in, in various fights over the years as the away fighter and is now kind of in a position where let's say he wins the rematch. He can kind of sail off into the sunset or not sail off into the sunset, probably sells his belt to the highest bidder at, at Emmanuel Navarrete or somebody like that. Um, who, I mean, we've already been proven wrong, who I wouldn't really give him much of a chance of beating, um, and then kind of goes away from there. But yeah, really, really shocking turn of events. And I'm really interested in the rematch. Now, I wasn't particularly interested in the fight. I mean, unlike you, I, I did feel like it was a was a bit of a soft touch for a first defense. I felt like we've seen Martinez stopped by Leo Santa Cruz. We've seen him stopped by Gary Russell. Obviously, different styles to, to Kid Galahad, but that kind of technical, strong, big at the weight, maybe too big at the weight, but big at the weight, I just felt like it was a bad style matchup for Kiko Martinez. Barry Jones, by the way, who's not here today because he's hiding after his prediction, uh, actually said that the fight would be over in less than eight rounds. And he was right. He but, was right. But he, um, but he picked a uh, Mr. Gallagher. I, I didn't, win. I didn't think that Martinez would win. I would, I would never mm. claim that. But I just thought that he would, he would do what he always does and give it a right good crack and it would be quite good to watch and, and he'd get beaten and, and he'd get stopped. That's that's what I expected expected to happen. But as you say, that that isn't what happened. And they've had a they've had a good few weeks, Spain, haven't they? Sandor mm. Martin beating Mikey Garcia and, and Martinez's career is really interesting because it all started the kind of road warrior aspect to it when he when he beat Bernard, Bernard Dunn. Dunn. Yeah, way well, back in the day. Yeah, fourteen years ago, I think. Way back yeah. in the day, away from home again in the first round. Um, you remember those couple of fights with Frampton and in between those two Frampton defeats, he went off and won his world title yeah. in America. Johnny Romero. That's yeah, yeah, in America, yeah. away from home. No one thought that was going to happen. That was another emphatic win. He yeah. knocked him out in two rounds or something. That was, yeah, he was, he is, was, he's given, he's given us so he much has, value yeah, over he the has, years, hasn't he? He really is a brilliant fighter. Exactly. You can't help but be really happy for him because, because of the way he's, he's gone about his, he's gone about his business. And you want people like that to, to get to the end of their career and feel like they have got the money to go along with what they've won. And hopefully now that'll that'll happen for him. But like you say, the rematch now is really... Mm. Rematches are always interesting, um, particularly if you've got somebody who's been beaten so comprehensively. And there was always going to be a rematch clause for that fight, of course, because it's a, it's it's a voluntary, voluntary defence. Yeah. But we, we've seen so many rematches at the minute. But generally speaking, the rematch sometimes has turned out to be a lot more interesting than the first fight. Maybe mm. not as explosive, but the build-up's more interesting because in the first fight, people think that one guy's going to win and they don't really say too much. And then in the second, everything's completely changed. Well, it's got all of these new added intangibles now where no matter how dominant Galahad could be in a second fight, it's always there now. And he knows it better than anybody, as well as Kiko. So that's always going to be there. And I just didn't feel like it was there in the first fight. And it was it was just absolutely shocking. Why we were on the subject of our Spanish boxing, we've also got Sergio Garcia versus Sebastian Fondora at some point. I can't remember what card that's on, but it's been rearranged various times throughout the year. That's a really interesting fight for me. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how that goes. You've got Sebastian Fondora, who's what, eight foot tall, and Sergio Garcia, who throws 150 punches around. So I think that that could be the, the, the hat-trick for Spanish boxing this year. So, yeah, we wait to see what happens with that, but we've got a lot to get through. So let's go on to another shocking, well, upset, admittedly not of the same magnitude. Uh, Alicia Baumgartner uh, looked, for me, absolutely sensational against Terry Harper, um, stopping her in the fourth round. Uh devastating loss for, for Terry Harper it was and I thought Harper would win that fight but I thought it would be hard I hadn't seen that much of Bam Gartner but I was going basically on what I would heard um, which was that she was good I thought she might be a little bit too 
basic for Harper, possibly, and Harper might be able to keep her turning, keep her moving, uh, and win the fight on points. But Baumgartner was was terrific. She obviously punches really hard. She's got that good kind of compact, economical, very pro style. Mm. Um, sets her feet, and when she hits you, it obviously really hurts. It obviously makes it makes an impact. I I saw quite a lot of this in the in the world amateurs where you've got a fighter who. They don't really look necessarily like they've got that single punch knockout power, but you can just tell bit by bit, oh, they must really mm. dig because their opponent is gradually just kind of retreating a little bit and throwing a bit less. And things are beginning to look a bit a bit grim and you can't pin it on one single punch and then it kind of dawns on you. It must be that every single one mm. has an impact. So... There seems to be all sorts of possibilities out there for her now. With with Harper, it's I think she's had a lot's happened to her in a short space of time. Yeah. I remember I covered her very first kind of TV fight, basically, where it was on that Avanesian Kelly card, the original one in late 2018, December 2018. And she got promoted from non-TV to Facebook and then to opening the TV part of the card, basically because Avanesian Kelly didn't happen. And Steffi Bull had been telling us how good she was. And she showed us she was really good. And then they clicked her up through the gears. And come early 2020, she's boxing for a world title. That's only 18, 19 months ago, but obviously feels like forever because mm. of because of COVID. Um, she's had quite a lot of injury problems. Uh, she's become famous, you know, within... Not just within boxing, I think within her local area, she she's kind of crossed over a bit, and and Sky put quite a lot behind her too when she was, when she was a Sky fighter, uh, and she had her first kind of taste of a little bit of a backlash with the draw against Jonas, where people thought that Jonas probably deserved it, and you find yourself in this weird position where, through no fault of your own, mm. people are kind of slagging you off like it's your fault that that the judges called it a draw, and it was a really close fight. So it's been a, it's been a massive roller coaster for her. I didn't expect what would happen on, on the weekend, but whereas Galahad has got to take the immediate rematch, I wouldn't No. if I was Steffi Ball with Harper. I don't think you need to. She's 25. She's already won a world title. She's already shown herself to be a really good fighter. She's still inexperienced. She had that massive gap between doing well as a junior, as an amateur, and then basically coming back into boxing. There's a lot more to come, and there's no rush. Mm. So I think they could do it differently with her and... And I kind of hope they they do because the top end of that division is, I mean, it's a brilliant division. You can see why Kala and Nissa chose it for the, for the WBS, Super Series yeah. because Michaela May is a a really good fighter. Um, Baumgarten is up there now. Pursuit's always really been a, a super featherweight. Hyun Mi Choi's on the radar for for Baumgarten the next maybe. I'm mm. not totally sure about that. Jonas obviously. You know, there's just loads of good fighters around that way. Loads of them. We saw Maya Hamadouche. Have, yeah, have, that was a good fight, yeah. wasn't it, Hiramaya? That was a good Very fight. Very close fight against Michaela Mayer. Just going back to Baumgartner, you mentioned something there about her having a pro style. And I actually I was speaking to some of our American... Uh, counterparts on Twitter and I sort of said that she had that kind of Midwest style it was very loose and it was very and she's from Detroit which I didn't actually know at the time so it kind of made sense and I felt like early in the fight you could really tell she'd come down from 140 and she looked strong she had thick set legs she had a very stable base but everything was nice and loose and nice and languid she hurt her in the second round I think she sort of caught her with a shot in the first round that got Harper's attention and then hurt her in the second round and that third round, I remember tweeting at the time, like, I felt like Baumgartner kind of allowed Harper to settle a little bit in the third round after hurting her in the second and felt that maybe she'd given her an opportunity to just settle down in the fight as the home fighter. But I think Baumgartner probably knew, look, I've got this girl exactly where I want yeah. her. And kind of the opposite to what we were talking about with Kiko, I know I'm going to get you. Yeah, and she got her. And what we you know, we sit on this couch all the time, and we slag off referees, and we slag off officiating to the high heaven. What a brilliant stoppage that was from Mark Lyson! Brilliant stoppage. Yeah, that it, it was perfect. Um, it was perfect because the next punch was gonna was gonna flatten Terry Harper. I, I don't see any doubt about that because she had her back half turned, and Bal Garner was going to come round the side with a left hook that she obviously wouldn't have seen. Not that she would have been any in any condition to take it, even if she could see it. Mm. So that could have been that could have been really bad. Um, and he jumped in. 
he was close enough to be able to jump in and get get the fight stopped exactly when he needed to. And you're right because officials do do get stick from everybody really. Um, so when they when they do a particularly good job, then then it needs to be recognised. I know what he would say. He would just say, "Well, that's what I'm there for," um, and he's right. That 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 is what he's there for. But you don't always see it. Mm. And what although we do all love a knockout. You don't need to see someone stretched out if it doesn't need to happen. Mm. And I was relieved. I was so relieved when he did that. Mm. He was always going to do it. There would never be any circumstances under which he wouldn't do it, but you just got to react quick enough. It's as simple as that. You've got to be, that's where your kind of referee's ring craft comes in. You're looking at Tarpa, you're thinking, is she okay? Probably not. What's going on with her? You know, there's And a lot. it happens like. Yeah, yeah, and it happens really, really quick. Really, really quick. So. He's been a good ref for ages. I remember when he got, I think him and John Latham got promoted to A-star referees at the same time about three years ago. He had a real difficult one with his first world title fight with Charlie Edwards and, and Julio Martinez. Yeah. And that, that, that was a, just a freak combination of circumstances, how that happened. We don't need to go into it now, but he turned his back for a split second at exactly the wrong time. Um, he was so unlucky. Mm. Um but yeah, he's been a good ref for ages, and that's the kind of decision that can that can I mean potentially save someone's life. I mean, we yeah. don't want to be too melodramatic about it. But, but it is true when your hands are down and you are all your tensile strength has left your body and you were standing there basically like a zombie. If you then get hit again, clean and hard by someone like her, I mean, anything could happen. Yeah, it was. It, uh, we've seen it kind of. Uh, a lot of people have discussed it. It was very similar to the Price Povetkin knockout where Price was gone for all intents and purposes he was gone he was yeah. on his feet and unfortunately I think it was Howard Foster was the referee for that I think um, and unfortunately we weren't able to get in there beforehand and what we saw was a, a really brutal knockout um, and it was good that we didn't see that for Terry Harper because she is still young um, and Baumgartner looks like she can really hit so I think she's going to be she's going to take some beating at 130 pounds from what we saw at the weekend, I think she's really going to take some beat. I was so impressed. I hadn't watched a lot of Baumgartner beforehand. I'd seen a very, very small amount of it. But I thought she was fantastic. I thought the first round, she looked a million dollars. She settled down. She had no qualms about being the away fighter, obviously, in, in Sheffield. And I know um, I know Terry Harper's from, from Doncaster, but it's Yorkshire, so it's still a home crowd. And she had no nerves. And even after the fight, and she'd said it beforehand, and we, you know, we've discussed this about... People who kind of come over and they say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And sometimes you don't always believe it. And you're almost trying to kid themselves. Beforehand, she said, look, she's not up for this. I can tell she's not up for this. I'm going to knock her out. And then after the fight, she said, yeah, I, I knew this week that she didn't fancy it. Or words to that effect. She probably didn't say that. Very English term. Um, and that's what we saw. So I feel that she's going to take some real beating at 1.30. Um, Michaela Meyer, a fight of Hamadouche, was a very good fight. But I'd probably back Baumgartner against um, against Michaela Meyer if that fight, if we do see that fight, either in the proposed WBSS or or as a unification fight. Um, so yes, 0-2 for uh, for British world champions this past weekend in Sheffield. Uh, before we move on, let's talk about the European champion, Chris Billum-Smith, making a successful first defence in a quite a messy fight against Dylan Brejon. Um, you would have seen Brejon box in the past. He's a big, awkward lump Um I thought he was very unlucky against Fabio Turkey out in um the Turkey, Turkey, out in Italy. I felt like he was, you know, there or thereabouts. If you get a, I think it was a majority or a split in Italy against the the home defending champion. So you can kind of draw your own conclusions about that one. Uh but in the end, a, a, a good win for Chris Billum Smith, albeit in a slightly messy fight. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a, a pretty accurate summary. Um, I expected him to win when when I saw that match was made, and I expected him to to get it done without too many problems. He's had a great run, Chris, and it was a good fight against McCarthy, obviously that got him the the European to to add to the British and the and the Commonwealth. And I think a a good thing for him to do would be to kind of bed in at that European level, yeah. take a few of those fights. I think I think Turchi might be next up for him. Mm. I think well, I might have read that somewhere. I think I think they because they tried to make the fight with Turchi beforehand. Uh, speaking to Chris, because I remember there was the, uh, the the rumor going around that he was boxing Alexei Papin, and I was thinking like, 
what <laughs> that doesn't make any sense yeah. and i spoke to him about it he's like what on a voluntary and i was like yeah okay that makes sense now but um the touchy fights that's, that's probably about right obviously yeah i think so i yeah. think so stuff like that and there's no there's no real reason i don't think to everybody does really seem to be in a rush nowadays mm. you know that that does make me sound really old but i think i think it's i think i'm right i think people are in a rush um you know, a fighter who's beaten him, who I know that he would love to rematch at some point, is Richard Riakpour. And and I've been very interested to see what, what he's done over the last couple of years, which obviously isn't a lot because he's not been able to box. Um, but he won the British title. And at that point, I thought the best thing for him to do would be to bed in at British yeah. and kind of catch himself yeah. up because he'd, he'd done brilliantly to win a series of 50-50s. But he'd also got a w, uh, number three ranking with the WBA at that mm. point, which he doesn't have anymore. He's still quite highly ranked with a couple of other governing bodies. But maybe at that point they were thinking, well, we can go more the kind of Anthony Yard route. Yeah. Why risk that ranking? And so they gave up the British. And So you've got a decision to make. But with Chris, well, you can have if something like that happens. Chris is, I think, in the top 10 with all four of them now. But I don't see any... If you get a world title fight, then of course you're going to take it. But... More time in the gym, more time sharing that gym with a Coley, more time working with Shane. I know they've been together for ages, but but you can see how he can improve, Chris Williams, mm. I think. And you just you're confident that he will because he's always struck me as one of those people who when he gets to the end of his career, he will have no regrets because he'll know that he's done everything he could have done. Is he good enough to win a world title? It's kind of a moot point really, because there's no metric for that no. it depends what fights you yeah. get and who the opponent is I mean it's as simple as that and with Breedis maybe having one more at Cruiser and then you think he'll probably move up and Nicole mm. will probably move up and Arsene Goulamirian's WBA champion he's boxing Egorov I think I think yeah. that's going on one of the cards yeah. I think that might be on the Lopez on the card I'm not sure uh, it's, it's going on a match there's possibilities mm. there's possibilities there definitely but that European title is a good. It's a good belt. It's a great title to have, and I think you may as well just. You could get your activity out of that. Mm. Well, actually, um, I've told this story a few times, and I know Chris fairly well. Um, and I remember when he'd had half a dozen fights, being in the gym, the old Wandsworth gym, um, McGuigan's gym, which has moved a couple of times since then. Um, and speaking to Jake McGuigan, who I'm part of the the McGuigan family, who look after Chris, and I remember at the time him saying, "Look, if we can get Chris a Commonwealth title." That's fantastic. You know, when he came out of the amateurs, Chris has told the story of him coming, traveling all the way up from Bournemouth to spar George Groves on, I think on Christmas Eve or New Year's Day or something like that. It was one of those kind of holiday days and sparring David Hay. And it, for him, really, it was kind of, that was everything in the world to him as it is often for a young fighter when you're, you're sharing the ring with a former two-weight world champion like David Hay or somebody like George Groves. So that was kind of the the level that they'd expected him to get to, which is, of course, now British Commonwealth European champion made a defence. I feel like a Coley being in the camp might help with regards to just holding him back a little bit because a Coley's kind of made no secret of the fact that he wants to box Myris Bradis and Gulamarian and Egorov. There's also Makabu who's knocking around with yep. the WBC. But I don't feel like there's going to be any rush from Chris Billum smith to, to push on for world titles while a Coley's still hovering around and looking for those unification bouts and ultimately trying to become undisputed. So I think that might help. And I think You've it needs to. to measure him. Against, yeah. Haven't you? Yeah. And um, they've done obviously a lot of rounds together as well. I don't ever see Chris Billum Smith going up to heavyweight. I think a Coley will definitely go up to heavyweight. Okay. Um, so I don't, and they have a fantastic relationship as well. I know we had Lawrence on, on the old podcast where you, you were down in, um, in Oval. And he'd said that, you know, coming into the camp, it was very much kind of, okay, well, he's in my way. And, you know, I know he's kind of around British level or looking to fight for British. Like, How is this going to work? But they get on like a house on fire and they've, they've obviously sparred a lot together. So I don't feel like there's any competition between them. I mean, they'll be small, obviously, particularly when they're doing the circuits and what have you. And I'm sure nobody wants to lose rounds in sparring and all of that good stuff. But I think it's generally good natured. So I think that might help because I do feel that, you know, a Turchi or a McCarthy rematch is is kind of the right yeah. fights for Chris Billum Smith. If he can get a fight down in Bournemouth, if they could do that, I mean, I don't see it happening. Him going over to Belfast as the champion and boxing Tommy McCarthy over there, but that kind of fight and having a big night for a British Commonwealth European title fight down in Bournemouth, I think would be perfect for him. 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. When 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 fighters turn pro now, a lot of the time they'll talk about how they want to be a world champion and and all the rest of it, and that's fine. Like you've got to have a long term goal, you've got to have a bigger picture, but you get there step by step mm. by step by step, and sometimes maybe it's better just to kind of keep that to yourself a little bit because the the example that everybody should follow I always think is Warrington Josh Warrington from from recent times because he never really did that and of course he turned professional and there was no fanfare no great fanfare when when Chris turned turned pro he got to a couple of ABA finals mm. you know he was a good amateur um but I think he was kind of you know he he felt that he was fortunate to a degree that that he managed to get Shane to to train him yeah. that he kind of earned it through the sparring but he was aware that look around the rest of the stable and kind of I am the odd one out yeah. here so he's taken it fight by fight by fight by fight and just day by day just wanting to get better every day and Warrington did exactly the same thing won an English title okay that felt pretty good what's next you know wins a Commonwealth title all right yeah that's, that's that. yeah I could handle that what's next and he's done the exact same thing he's done the exact same thing and that is the way to do it that just is the way to do it step by step and not get too carried away with this grand ambition or plan you have. Because you can have a goal, that's fine. But the idea that you can have a plan to get you there is pretty laughable, really. Yeah, particularly because, in boxing. <laughs> yeah, it, it is pretty laughable. If you're going to set yourself, well, I need to won this title by, by this stage, you don't ever really want to go down that road because there's just so many things you don't control. All you can do, and it's a massive cliche, but all you can do is just think, right, what's the next level? What's the next step? And how do I get there? And that's what he's doing. And defend that European title, it'll probably, it will at least keep your ranking where it is mm. or maybe even increase it and then just see what happens. Like he's not, he's not young, but he's not old. Um, I think things could work out very nicely for him. Yeah, he's already kind of just, he's already a bit of a success story for yeah, considering exactly. where he started from. You mentioned Shane McGuigan there. He told a really funny story when he came in uh, on the podcast, Chris, where he said, well, I'd sort of, I'd been in the gym with Shane. So I thought, well, I'll start at the top. And when he says no, I'll go and ask some other coaches. And he's only just so happened that he turned around and said, okay, yeah. And he kind of went from there. That kind of sums Chris's attitude up, really. He is quite, he's very unassuming, very grounded. Just moved to London now. So he's kind of, He's around more. He's kind of outside yeah. the, the Bournemouth bubble, which while he still has a, a, a good fan base there, I think that can be important sometimes when you're yeah, not necessarily so. in a hotbed of boxing. Um, ultimately, he does want to, to bring boxing down there. I know Eddie's wanted to do it for a while. I think they were planning on doing it before the pandemic. They that were, was the plan, were. wasn't there? Jordan, just one second. Can you turn the, the clock round, Jordan? There we go. Just, oh, yeah, cool. we got to get going. Right, okay. Chris Billum Smith defended his European title. Going into late night, uh, Jaime Munguia versus Gabe Rosado. Like, sometimes with Gabe Rosado, I remember the Martin Murray fight being one, the Danny Jacobs fight being another, where you get this promise of this, the blood and guts and luster and all of that stuff, and it doesn't always translate into what you see in the ring. Saturday night against Jaime Munguia, who I think is improving as a fighter, was an excellent fight. Very, very good fight, but ultimately one that... Munguia had to show a few things and I feel like he's under the guidance of Eric Morales, my favourite ever Mexican. I feel like he's developing into a, a very, very interesting proposition at 160 pounds now, Munguia. And he's good to watch. Yeah. Uh, and he always has been. Uh, you're right about Rosado. He he has been in loads of really good fights, but sometimes he's a clever guy. Like yeah. Sometimes he, that's not really what he's going to do because he feels that there's a better option for him other than do that. He knows he can do it. We all know he can do it, but he's also actually a sort of well-schooled Philadelphia fighter. Mm. He knows what he's doing. And I remember that fight against Murray because I did that fight. And it wasn't what we thought it would be because he thought, I think I can outbox Martin Murray. It turned out he couldn't in the end because Murray's kind of the same. You know, mm. he's a much, he's a better schooled fighter than people gave him credit for. But that was just a really good fight. And I was confident heading into that one that it would be because of the pair of them, mm. basically. And it delivered. It really did. And, and Rosado, I think he's always destined to fall just short, isn't he, in terms of winning a in terms of winning a world a world title. But I just don't think it matters. Mm. I hope it doesn't really matter to him, because in terms of his reputation and legacy, which fighters are obsessed with, it just doesn't matter. 
it doesn't matter. He's done his thing and he's done it well for a long time. He's still doing it. He still looks like he's got plenty to give. He must have lived a life very, very consistently all the way through mm. his career uh, because he has been in a lot of hard fights. But I agree about Munguia. You know, it's, it is kind of an interesting division that at the moment. It's really opening up. Yeah, it's really opening up. Because the the post-Golovkin and Canelo yeah, era is kind of... that's not going to be long, is it? The no, post -Golovkin. no, no. Um, it's not going to be long at all. So you've got him and Murata fighting for the IBF and the, and the WBA, Andrade with the with the WBO, Charlo with the WBC. It's There are definite possibilities there for him, I think. Mm. Which one of those did you give him? I mean, the Golovkin fight is what we've kind of seen the clamour for in the last 48 hours or so since the fight. Which one of those champions do you think Munguia has the best chance of beating? Probably Charlo, I reckon. Probably Charlo. Uh, I think Andrade is... I'm a bit of a fan when it comes to Andre. I did a few of his fights. Um, me and Macklin sat down and did a did a podcast with him when he was over in London, I think, for Dillian White, Joseph Parker, maybe mm. something like that. And and you just got the impression that he was somebody who knew he understood the the business. He understood the uh, he understood it all, and he has found himself in a little bit of a frustrating position. I don't see Munguia being able to do an awful lot with him. Charlo, on the other hand, I think he might be able to get to grips with him a bit easier than he would Andrade. I guess we'll have to see how Golovkin looks against Murata. I mean, we're all kind of expecting him to beat Murata. I would be really surprised if he didn't, but he is coming towards the end. And that potentially could be a pretty astonishing fight, Golovkin mm. against Munguir, I think. Yeah, it really could be great. That real Mexican style against kind of the new era of Mexican style. And I feel like Munguia is improving. He's less wild than he was. He, you know, he's shortened up and straightened up his shots a lot more under Eric Morales. And he's got him working behind those nice straight shots nicely. Um, Rosado, some man. I mean, you mentioned about him living the life in between fights. He's done it from 154, 160. Obviously had that brilliant win over Bechtum and Melikuzi, but 168. Uh, the Jacobs fight, okay, wasn't the greatest fight I've ever seen by any stretch of the imagination. It's been very competitive against, you know, a world-level guy in, in Danny Jacobs. And uh, Saturday night, I think he took more shots against Jaime Munguia than he'd ever taken, but he was still in there and he was still firing back and he still seemingly at least has his his faculties about him. When you consider the amount, of, the stretch of fights that he's been on over in his career, it really is astonishing. Um, elsewhere in America, because we have to get through this, um, elsewhere in America, David Benavidez in his, I guess you could call it an audition for uh, Canelo Alvarez. Um, obviously, we were, we were expecting him to box uh, Uzcata guy, which unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, he failed a drugs test. So we got to see him against Kyron Davis, who while very tough and hung in there, didn't really offer too much. Uh, David Benavides, is he the man to beat Canelo for you if he if he does indeed get that fight next? No, but but he's got as good a chance of... He's got the best chance of getting it if Canelo sticks around at £168. He's got a better chance of getting it than anybody else. You're just in this situation where when it comes to selecting an opponent for Canelo at super middle... There is no audition you can do that really means anything. Um, is there? No. There just isn't. Benavidez has got the best credentials of anybody I can think of because he's he had that kind of like blip. Um, he's an unbeaten former two-time world champion, which is just astonishing weird, to say. Yeah, <laughs> he's still quite young as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't really see any other options for Canelo at, at super middleweight. He's unified the division. I don't know if I'd really see the point, to be honest, in him in him boxing Benavidez, as rude as that sounds to, to Benavidez, but there's the Mexican American connection there and they could do it on Cinco de Mayo and mm. that would be pretty neat, you'd think. I think we kind of mentioned this briefly before we start filming. I think Benavidez versus Canelo. I think Benavidez almost guarantees you a great fight in that fight. But I just don't really see how he wins the fight. I have to say, I feel like um, a lot of Benavidez's opponents are, in a way at least, somewhat beaten before they get in the ring with him. He's massive at the weight. He punches hard. He's busy as well, which we don't always see for a fighter of his size. He's a, he's a busy guy, lets his hands go a lot. But I just feel like there's, there's too many areas that Canelo could potentially exploit. And I just don't really see... 
I mean, Canelo's taken some some serious shots from some serious punchers. Gennady Golovkin obviously being one. And I just, outside of chinning him, I just don't really see how you're going to beat him at this particular moment, unless it's 175 pounds. I mean, so, somebody like Dimitri Bivol with his kind of in-and-out style, but I don't really feel like he's necessarily, I feel like Bivol's slightly tailed off a little bit in his career. Um, I actually spoke to Eddie, uh, Eddie Hearn, of course, who's promoted Dmitry Bivol for a number of years now, and he said that you know post Max Dadashev, who was a very very close friend of Dmitry Bivol, he feels he might have lost something, and I think you can kind of see that in some of his performances. Um, poor taste, of the killer instinct. I don't necessarily feel is there anymore with Dmitry Bivol. I think Baturbiev is the fight. I think that's if if you if you're looking to get Canelo beat. I mean, if you if you're looking for somebody who I feel has a, a legitimate bona fide chance of beating Canelo Alvarez I think it's it's Artur Baturbiev and I'm not really sure if David Benavides is that guy yet but I think it's a big fight and I think it would be pretty much guaranteed action but I'm just not sure if I would well I am sure I, I don't think I could really give him any chance of winning the fight but having said that I didn't give Kiko Martinez a chance either uh moving on this weekend Terence Crawford versus Sean Porter um yeah thoughts Andy I just love it I love it as a fight I know that what everybody wants to see and has done for a while is Crawford against Spence but let's just kind of concentrate on what we have got rather than what we haven't and and it's a great fight I was I was in Vegas when they did the very first kind of press engagement between the two it was a lunchtime um, on the Saturday with Fury Wilder three in the evening so I trotted along to that to pick up some bits for Sky and there's a really good kind of chemistry between the two, if you like, because they know each other from the amateurs. They never boxed in the amateurs. They do get along, but you get the feeling that it wouldn't take all that much for a little bit of a disagreement mm. and some genuine needle to spark between the two. There's a little bit of a story with, with Crawford and Kenny Porter where yeah. they kind of squared off at one point during the amateurs. I tried to get into that with him in a kind of playful way, but... He said, nah, there's nothing really much there. We're good. We're good pals now. But they know what, what's at stake here. You know, Porter turned up on the day with his spectacular shape as always, but with a waistcoat and no shirt on. And they're, they're just brilliant, those two, at selling that fight, I think, too, because he's a great talker, Porter. Crawford can be, too, when he wants to be. Um, and with him, we know what we're going to get from Porter. We know the level he's been at. And what he can do because he was he was so good again against against Spence. But with Paul, with Crawford, we're still in what I think is this really interesting situation where, despite how celebrated he is by almost all boxing fans, and and I think he's a very good fighter, I still think he's got something to prove because at super lightweight he did everything you could do. But it sounds churlish to say it, I would have to rank that as probably the softest full unification of 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 the lot of of the male fighters um, that we've that we've seen and at welterweight you know who's he really beaten you could you could argue mm. i agree i agree um, it seems absolutely crazy to say it for a three-weight world champion former undisputed champion but yeah i still don't really know how good he is and at 147 pounds, we've seen him box Jeff Horn, who, you know, other than the win over Manny Pacquiao, and people could, I felt that he won that fight against Manny Pacquiao. Yeah. Our American counterparts completely disagree, and Pacquiao was robbed. I think Pacquiao had an exceptional, I think it was the ninth round, where he hurt Horn badly, and he yeah, was he really was putting it on him, yeah. Uh, but other than that, I mean, and Jeff Horn had the physical advantages. He roughed Pacquiao up. He made it awkward for him. He had that really wide stance horn, so it's difficult for Pacquiao to pivot around the target. Barry Jones is not here, but still got a pivot in there somewhere. Uh, I feel like stylistically, and sometimes you just get the stars will align for a fighter in one night where he was the home favorite. It was outdoors and blistering Australian heat, That's and he it. was able to make it a, an attritional fight. For I mean, obviously, Pacquiao went on to beat Keith Furman and kind of the ageless Pacquiao um, went on to have success after that, but it was still an older, past-peak Pacquiao, and, and he was able to kind of make the fight his fight, Jeff Horn. But then he got stopped by Michael Zarafa. He's not really done an awful lot 
before or since then. He had the win over Gary Corcoran, um, Ali Fonecker. Like the, they're not marquee wins. And then you kind of look at Kel Brook, who passed his best, I think it's fair to say, at that point. Amir Khan, the same could be said of him. Um, then we've had uh, Kavlyauskas, Me Machine, who arguably, if not in my opinion, did score a knockdown in that fight against Terence Crawford. And you're starting to get up in weight against guys who, you know, when he was boxing Yuri Orkis Gamboa, when he was a lightweight, he was significantly bigger than Gamboa. Gamboa, as you all know, was a flyweight uh, gold medalist at the Olympics all of those years ago. Him boxing as a lightweight, even as a professional, I know he's kind of boxed with Devin Haney and Davis and people like that since, but uh, his best as a pro, he was a featherweight, if not maybe super featherweight. Um, so this is a real live fight for me. I am fascinated by this because I'm probably one of the Despite rating Crawford as probably one, it's certainly one of the top 10 pound for pound, however you want to look at pound for pound, I still don't feel like I can really rubber stamp it just yet. But I think he'll raise his game for this. I think this is what he needs uh, and, and I'm confident that he will do it and, and I do pick him to win. Porter will produce a very good performance. I don't really have any doubt about that, but I think Crawford will be too skillful for him. Porter will make him show us mm. why people think he is what he is. And it's not like he hasn't proven it in some degree, but we do need those big performances from him in big fights. And I do think that we'll get one. And I think it will need to be one because if it isn't, then Porter will beat him. But that was a brilliant fight against Spence. It's probably, mm. it might be what is maybe my favourite ever fight to have, to have commentated on because it was just terrific all the way through and so close and then decided by that just that short left hook on the inside that saw Porter touch down but not go down mm. you know, that's that's how tough he is and and what a shot it was as well yeah it was brilliant it was, there was a whole perfect together and yeah deliver that kind of punch after what had been a very very grueling fight was that 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 was what I loved about it and it just had everything you could possibly want and I hope that Saturday is exactly the same because you did get the feeling when when we were kind of around them for that initial press conference that this was that this was a really, really good fight. And you looked at the run of fights we had coming up and you just thought, yeah, this is that this is the one. This is the one that should really give us what we what we want. Um and Las Vegas is kind of firing back on all cylinders again mm. now, isn't it? You know, they've had a good a good trot of of really good matchups and I would be surprised if this doesn't deliver. I really would. I can't remember the last Sean Porter fight that didn't deliver. I can't really remember it. Has he been in a bad fight? No, I mean, I I, I thought that fight against Cal Brook was really close. Yeah, I did as well. We saw, I saw somebody... Uh, I think I scored it to Porter on the night and, and I didn't kind of like try and hide the fact either. I, I just, I, I turned the sound off. If I'm going to do it in my kind of like anal way, then, then that's what I do. And... By the end of the fight, I think... Uh, no, I did. I definitely did have him winning. And I wasn't the only one. There were, there were quite a few other people. But I thought that was a really close fight. But then having said that, speaking to people who were actually there, they said it wasn't. Mm. So possibly it was one of those where if you were ringside, you could see what Brooke was doing, whereas on the TV, maybe you couldn't. But having said that, most people watching it on TV seem to think that, that, that Brooke won. Um but yeah, I thought that was a really close fight. Yeah, I don't think this is kind of where I was going to come on to with Sean Port. I don't we've not seen him conclusively beaten. The Thurman fight was a brilliant fight. And that yeah. was another fight that was close. 7-5, I think was kind of the score across the board on that. The Spence fight, as you mentioned, the yeah. knockdown kind of ultimately decided that. And the Brook fight. I think the Brook fight, this is kind of where you get into people talking about primes and blah, 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 blah. I feel like Sean Porter's a better fighter now with the experience that he's accrued from fighting those other big names at welterweight. The Ordenis Ugas fight was a close fight as well, depending on how you look at it. I think I gave him, I think I gave it to Porter by a round, but it was still a very close fight. And I feel like some of the success that Ugas was able to have against Porter will probably see from Terence Crawford this weekend. I don't think, I feel like Thurman to a degree fought the wrong fight but also I felt like Sean Porter made him fight that fight we've seen Thurman struggle when fighters put it on him and, and you know don't give him that time to breathe you've got to be really good not to end up fighting Sean Porter exactly fight. Spence I mean I think Spence mentioned after the fight that he kind of 
he wanted to stand there and dog it out with him and show him that he could do that. It's one thing saying that, but you know, could you get behind the jab for 12 rounds against Terence uh, against Sean Porter? Because we've not seen it yet. Kel Brook hurt him in the first round with that right hand down the pipe at the end of the first round. I think other than the Spence knockdown, it's one of the... I know, Broner had him over in the uh, the 12th round where Broner finally let his hands go after all of these years. <laughs> but also, it's worth it. This is kind of what's so admirable about Sean Porter throughout his career. He's took these he's took these opponents, he's fought the top level guys, win some, lose some. He boxed Adrian Broner, I think it was like 144 pounds or 145 pounds. And when you consider, I mean, the much talked about fact that he'd actually beaten Alexander Usyk as, yeah. a, as an amateur. Great stat, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the unified heavyweight champion. Yeah. Um, I think he debuted at 164 pounds. So the fact that he could yeah. kind of get down to 144 yeah. with a rehydration clause against, that was probably the last of Broner as a, a kind of a bona fide A-side fighter, I think. Yeah. After that, after he lost that fight is when we started to really see the plummet um i'm gonna play devil's advocate here terence crawford beats sean porter by decision we've seen kelbrook beat him we've seen keith Furman beat him we've seen errol spence beat him is a win over sean porter what we need to anoint terence crawford as, as the number one 147 pounder in the world considering he has been beaten by certainly three if not you know some people would say that your dennis ugas beat him as well i think it depends on the on the manner of the performance and, and the fight itself I still wouldn't put him above Spence at welterweight, I don't think. If he really does a number on Porter, then I think I would I would have to in that instance because I just don't see Porter turning up and showing us that he is over the hill or mm. something has happened to him since the last time he boxed. I think if he gets comprehensively beaten, it'll have to be because Crawford has been that good and you would have to you would have to give him that. Um, so it depends on the performance, really. I, I think, it, yeah, if, if he beats him really comprehensively, then then I might sneak him ahead of Spence. But if it's not that and it's close, like it was against Spence, then I think I probably would still have Spence just slightly sneaking up there, up there above him. I think with someone like Porter, I, I really like the fact that now he is a beloved fighter and that everybody understands that, that that he is an elite level fighter because for a while I think people looked at him and, and and this happens quite often with fighters who seem quite basic. People think, well, he works hard in the gym and he's really, really fit, but you know, his technique's maybe not all there. Against a really skillful fighter then he'll get found out and and you could argue that that has happened at times, but only against really, really good mm. fighters. Only against really good fighters. It's it's really lazy to look at someone who is aggressive and does never stop coming forward and maybe does take a few shots and just think, oh, well, that's all there is. You, that, that can't be all there is mm. or you wouldn't get to where he's got to. You can maybe you can maybe win a lesser title than that doing that because it can be hard to deal with. But but again, I saw in the amateurs, you know, you've got, you've got, it's a shorter format, obviously, but you've got fighters who, what you need to do to nullify them is really, really obvious. But doing it is an entirely different thing. Mm. So I like the fact that Porter's now, well over the last few years, is really, is really, you know, people appreciate him because because he's great. You know, he's good to watch. He, he knows how to sell a fight. He's a brilliant talker. Uh, he, he's a great ambassador for the sport. All, all of that. He's got it all. He's got it all. So I hope he sticks around for a bit longer if it doesn't go his way on Saturday. Yeah, we've also seen him like you. We've seen him show a, a different side to his skill set in some fights over the years as well. The Danny Garcia fight, I uh, feel like he's against Danny Garcia. The way to beat Danny Garcia, who's you know a good puncher but flat-footed ultimately. And we saw Sean Porter box on the outside for for a lot of that fight and get the win against Danny Garcia there. Um, having said that. I feel like the way that he's going to have his best chance of beating Terence Crawford, he has to be Sean Porter. Uh, yeah, yeah, he has to be what we've seen of him over the last yeah. ten years. He has and to, I yeah. don't think there'll be any confusion in his mind about that. Yeah, yeah. I don't think he's going to do what Joshua did against Usyk, for example, and try and outbox the last boxer. boxer yeah. yeah, I don't think he's going to do that. I don't. I don't see any prospect of that happening. Yeah, he has to be ugly and rough and elbows and heads. Andre Berto, that was not a very good Sean Porter fight. The Andre Berto fight was not very good. Um, lots of headbutting and I think he at the end of the fight he had two cuts over his own eyes. 
in that and his dad came in and put you know the sweat band over his yeah. head and he dropped it down over his eyes he almost looked like something from the x-men because he was trying to yeah. hide his cuts but that's the kind of fight that he needs to make it against terence crawford the problem that he's got is that terence crawford is not just a fancy dan boxer he's not somebody who just likes to keep it long and he he's a not very nice man in the ring terence crawford which i feel like when you get to that level of of, of elite status okay we've kind of both suggested that we still need to see a little bit I still need to still like to see a little bit more from Terence Crawford but the the meshing and the blending of the skill set and also that ruthless side that he does have uh, I watched a very chilling uh, clip on social media yesterday where he'd said you know a lot of fighters will jump around and shout and scream and tell you I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that I'm the type of guy just to say oh yeah let's go in that room and one of us will walk out and there's something ominous about the way that terence crawford carries himself because of that he is a he's a not very nice man when he gets into the ring as, as well as being a very skilled technician so i think it's this is one i mean i hope we don't live to regret it i could constantly make mistakes it seems on this couch but um i think it's going to be a really really good fight i don't really see crawford dominating porter because i don't think we've seen it and i feel like this is crawford's toughest test of his career would you agree with that yeah I think it probably is because as I said before the super lightweight days it's the old cliche you can only beat whoever is there to be beaten and he did it and he did it comfortably but I think this probably is his hardest fight w with him I don't have too much doubt although there's always going to be some that it's there this next absolutely kind of supersonic level that mm. we haven't quite seen yet because he hasn't had the opponents to bring yeah. it out of him. I think it is there and I think that he will be capable of showing it on the weekend and all the really best great fighters, they've got what you just talked about there where they can do it any which way and they're happy to do it any which way. You know, think about someone like Andre Ward, mm. Olympic gold medalist, you know, impeccable manners, all of that stuff, really good technical fighter. But if you wanted to have it with him, then that's fine. We can yeah, what's the thing. Mikel Kessler fight? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Any which way you want to do it, we can do it that way and I will win. Um, and sometimes they do really want to, you know, take it to the to the cobbles, as, as, as we'd say, because they it'll, it'll, it'll get on their nerves that people are suggesting that they can't, can't. do that or worse, that they don't want to. Mm. And that's that... You see that again and again and again. Sometimes they'll fight a fight that they shouldn't really fight because it just irritates them that people say that. Whenever I think about that kind of scenario, I always think about Bradley against Provodnikov. Bradley yeah. like just almost, well, not almost, willfully <laughs> fought a completely absurd fight, really, because he was fed up with people saying it, that he, that he doesn't want to do that. Um, and he's not, he's not Terence Crawford kind of level of fighter, so... Yeah, there there is something quite kind of chilling about those guys sometimes when you talk to them. You know that their their confidence is completely rock solid and that whatever they needed to do to win, they would they would do it. It's gonna be boxing is such a fickle sport as you know better than most. If he loses Terence Crawford, I think the the worry or the concern is as, as a boxing fan is that people will say oh well at 140 he boxed Thomas Delorme Ray Beltran Julius Ndongo who in my opinion with all due respect is in my opinion the worst unified champion that I've seen so it's certainly somebody who has picked up two belts individually um the win over um he had the win over we've just spoken about Troy it, Edward Troyanovsky in in 40 seconds caught him with that caught him cold with that beautiful backhand that he had from the southpaw stance and then beat uh you know past his best ricky burns and then people say well he only boxed horn and these guys and what have you there's that's exactly what people will that's say. exactly what people will say i'll probably say that um but yeah i don't think they really should because you can't you can only fight what's put in front of you and it's yeah. not his fault that he's boxed at 140 pounds when there wasn't a josh taylor or a regis progre or a jose ramirez at the time um Arguably, his best win is still Victor Postol, who obviously yeah. had was coming off the good win over Lucas Matisse. So yeah, it's it's a tough one. If I had to push you for a prediction for that fight, what would you say? I'd say that Crawford will win on points, um, and I think it will be close but clear enough. 
so a kind of 115, 113 where you couldn't really give Porto more than five rounds. So, it's, so it sounds really, really close, mm. but actually you're not really left in too much doubt that Crawford has won. And I think it'll, to kind of break it down a bit more, I think it'll be the final few rounds where, where Crawford doesn't necessarily take over and really, really dominate Porter, but it'll be the final few rounds where he's just got a little bit more left in the tank, possibly, and he's just able to hold his technique and his boxing together that bit better and find the target and find the gaps that bit better because he just is that bit better. Um, but Porter will push him really, really hard like he did against Spence. I mean, similar kind of, hopefully, you know, similar kind, similar kind of thing. Yeah, this is a fight that I've wanted to see for a long time and with with respect to Sean Porter, it's been as kind of a measuring stick as I think a lot of people are going to look at it this weekend. You're going to see somebody who's been in there with pretty much everybody against somebody in Terence Crawford, who we've been all screaming out for him to face a, you know, cross the street, as our American counterparts like to say, and, you know, fight one of these PBC welterweights who seem to have kind of 90% of the welterweight division on their roster. And I've always felt that Sean Porter would be a tough fight for Terence Crawford. But having said that, it's, it's difficult to pick Porter in the fight, considering the fact that he's lost to three, at the time, elite, welterweights Keith Thurman certainly was an elite welterweight at the time he was the number one in the division it was before Spence had kind of beaten Brook and, and got himself onto that level Spence of course was and, and still is in many ours included the number one in the division and Kel Brook I think Kel Brook was an exceptional welterweight for a period of time I agree so it's hard to say that Crawford isn't because we've not seen that he isn't but almost haven't seen that he is yet so there's so many question marks I think around it but gun to my head I would probably agree with you and say it would be a 7-5-ish maybe 8-4-ish decision for Terence Crawford but I wouldn't be surprised if Sean Porter beats him and that may be a surprise to some but I really wouldn't be surprised I wouldn't be surprised waking up I say waking up I'll be up um, or trudging off to bed at six o'clock in the morning on Sunday and having Sean Porter have upset the apple cart by outworking him don't necessarily see him stopping Terence Crawford, but outworking him and, and potentially pushing him down the stretch. But sounds like I'm sitting on the fence. I kind of am a little bit, but I think Terence Crawford seven five eight four is probably about right. Yeah, same. I, I wouldn't be amazed if if Porter. I would be surprised if Porter beat him, but but you couldn't. I mean, it would be a bit insulting to Porter to be completely aghast. If yeah, that, if that turns out to be what happens. Um, and it is that situation with Crawford. It's it's everything he's done suggests that he is absolute elite level, and an elite is a word that's bandied around a bit too loosely in boxing. I mm, think and Porter's not, but if you beat him, you are. Mm. That that's where we are with that. I think really, and and I think yeah, I do think Crawford will beat him, but to do it, he will have to prove to us that he is what a lot of people have always said that he is. I remember when he came over to fight Ricky Burns and um, again, it was it was similar to when, when Spence came over to fight <coughs> Kel Brook, the American press that travelled with him, were just so confident. And not in a, I'll just be slightly careful how I word it, not not in what can be their fairly typical gung-ho fashion. Yeah. They would just know seriously, like, this kid is, you know, we love Ricky Burns, he's a good champion, maximum respect for Kel Brook, but nah. And they were right. <laughs> mm. It happens every now and again, mm. doesn't it? So sometimes, <laughs> sometimes people come over with a with a with a massive reputation, and it doesn't, and they don't quite deliver. Or the person they're fighting, or or our guy, if you want to do the US versus UK thing, it's just better than they thought he was. And we've seen we've seen you know a good a good few of them you know down the years as well. But but with those two, they they were just nah. This is you know this is a different this is a different thing altogether. Um, but now is the time. Now is the time. And then people will scream and shout for for Crawford against Spence. But, you know, that's a whole other conversation. It's, it's kind of hard to see that happening, really. Yeah. And I think Terence Crawford re-signs with top rank. I don't think uh, he crosses the street permanently. Uh, but we've had to kind of... There's these narratives that are going around on Twitter about who, who wanted the fight, who made the fight, and congratulations to Sean Porter for taking the fight. And then you've got the other side going, well, actually, Frank, you know, Terence, we've had to force it through a mandatory, kind of getting rid of all of that. 
I think he does stay at top rank and, you know, Errol Spence has, has had his issues outside of the ring. Uh, of course, hopefully he makes a speedy recovery from his latest injury, his eye injury, but it looks as though he's back in the gym. Looks as though we could see him back in the ring sometime soon. But you would think he probably goes and boxes your Dennis Ugas next because that's an easy fight to make. And then how long does Crawford wait around? Does he then jump up to 154? He's, yeah. he's already he spoken about Josh that. Taylor, Terrence Crawford. Yeah. Is what he needs. He needs Josh Taylor. He needs someone to come up um, because I just see just so many problems with that fight against Spence, just so many that I don't really have any optimism that it's that it's going to happen. I, I've kind of gave up on it a while ago, to be mm. honest, um, which is terrible. But that really does look like the situation. So he needs he needs Josh Taylor to to come up, and again they they're both top rank. You know that would be that would be an easy fight to make. And if you're Josh Taylor. Who else is there out there for you at super lightweight? Unless someone else comes up from below you, mm. with Tiafimo Lopez, but he's top ranked too. I mean, they're all. Josh is in a good position, I think. Yeah, whichever, I've... whatever happens, whether he stays or whether he moves up, there's a massive fight there for him, and and him against Crawford would be, yeah, would be brilliant. Would be brilliant. And that's the fight he wants. I went up to see Josh, and how do I put this? He was enjoying life as undisputed champion. Um, Never a fan of you. You always see people like, oh, well, you won't be champion long in between like, going and partying and blah, blah, blah. When you become undisputed champion, yeah. you can have a, you can have a few months of, a, of living the life of a champion, so to speak. And, and one of the things that he said to me was, look, I really want the Crawford fight. Mm. He's like, I, would, he's like, I wouldn't move up. And I don't think Josh Taylor is tight at 140. I think everybody has to kind of make, make weight and nobody enjoys making weight, certainly. But I think he could be a career 140 if he so desired. But he said that he would move up for the Crawford fight. If the Crawford fight was there, that's the fight that he wants. Um, obviously, we've seen him and Tiafimo Lopez going back and forward. But that would be the fight that would kind of lure him up to 147. And I think that would be a brilliant fight. I think stylistically, it'd be a great fight. I know Josh Taylor well enough to know that he believes that he would win that fight 100%. And I'm sure Terence Crawford would feel the same. Um, but of course, he does have to get past Sean Porter this weekend first. Certainly not counting Sean Porter out. We've got 11 minutes left. So before we wrap things up, let's talk about Friday night in America. The WBO middleweight champion, who we mentioned already, Demetrius Andrade, defends against Ireland's Jason Quigley. Tall order for Jason Quigley, I think, against Demetrius Andrade. It is a tall order. It's been interesting watching his, his pro career develop. I remember him winning a, a silver medal at the World Championships in Kazakhstan in 2013 and it was off the back of that which is a very difficult thing to do it was off the back of that that you know he went into the pros with a big big reputation and, and rightly so I thought it was kind of he just sort of drifted a bit because he was all of a sudden then in the west coast of, yeah. of the United States of America and he was being kind of marketed as, as kind of like this Irish Mexican yeah, style yeah, fight yeah. to El Animal and all of yeah, that yeah, yeah. it just didn't really work no. it just didn't really work um, he had a glitch, he had a bump in the road, which which can happen to anyone. And then since he's moved and hooked up with Andy Lee, um, I think he's kind of happier. I remember Andy saying to me quite soon into their relationship that he was quite surprised at some of the things that not that, that he couldn't do, that he just obviously hadn't been taught. You know, he was a bit shocked. You know, well, how, how, how's this happened? Because... Because of how good he is and where he's and where he's been, but it's a it's a real. So I'm glad to see him get a world title fight, but it's a big ask against Andrade because I know Andrade's a little bit of a, a kind of bogeyman in that division, in that no one really seems to want to fight him, and he's just endlessly calling people out to the point where I don't really know what else he can do. You know, mm. he, he did it to Canelo, and Canelo kind of dismissed him in very offhand fashion and made him look like a little bit of a fool, which he doesn't really deserve because he's, you know, he was a really good amateur too. And, and he's a pretty long reigning world champion now, mm. but he is very good. Whatever people might think about him stylistically, he is very good. And I don't really see, unfortunately, how Jason quickly can beat him. I'm afraid. Does he have to? I mean, we saw Liam Williams. Uh, I expected more from Liam Williams, I have to say, um, against Demetrius Andre. I, I think that was an example of how good Andre is, though, mm. because a, a lot of people did. A mm. lot of people thought that Williams would be able to bring that heat and bring that pressure 
that he would be the stronger of the two, that he would be the heavier puncher of the two, but he was the one who was down early in the fight. That first round was torrid. Yeah. Very torrid. And we've seen it from Andre. I think he knocked down Luke Keeler in the first 10 seconds of the fight. Yeah. By the way, Andre Keeler, the biggest week in the history of boxing social because Jake Paul was on the undercard. So great stuff. So anybody who says that to me, it's Andre can't sell. Oh, I did that. I did that card. <laughs> yeah, that, that extraordinary spectacle between Jake Paul and Anderson Gibb. I mean, me and Macklin were, we struggled with that one. We didn't really know what to say about it. But I think Andre is a good example of what we were talking about before where he is seen as his slick stylist. And for that reason, somehow people seem to think that, oh, well, he couldn't mix it. Mm. You know, he couldn't, he couldn't, if you take it to him, he's not going to like it. But having met him, he's definitely from that kind of school whereby that would annoy him. And he would just think, like, how, how, how dare you? Just because I can box, you're assuming, like, I can't fight. Mm. I think he would be more than happy just to, just to stand there and, and, and have it up close. I think that's pro- probably what we saw, certainly in the early rounds of, of the Williams fight. He yeah, really did, there, yeah, he it? really stuck it on Liam Williams in that first round. Yeah, um, just to show him and just yeah. to show everybody else. It's just like, who are you to say that that, that this British guy can come over here and he's going to want it more than me? Mm. And, he's, and he, basically what you're saying is like playground speak style. He's harder than me. Yeah. yeah. What you're telling yeah, is that he's yeah. harder than me. You know, None of them are going to react well to that. But having said that, there were some moments late in the fight, as there can be in Demetrius Andrade fights, where the legs don't move as fast as they did in the first three or four rounds. The hands drop a little lower. He's It's, it's difficult because a lot of people kind of refer to Andrade as slick. I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I don't think he is particularly slick. I think he's athletically gifted. But I don't necessarily see a lot of slickness in his style. He's not somebody who's going to stand in the pocket and make you miss a bunch of times or... or no, he's yeah. a good mover. Yeah, he moves well athletically, but he does slow down. And I felt like in the second half of the Williams fight, and Williams did tremendously well to make it to the second half of that fight, and he deserves tremendous credit for that. But he did have some moments late in the fight. Now, again, playing devil's advocate, can Quigley do that? If Quigley can get through those first four or five rounds where, I mean, Andre is also, how, like looking at him now and meeting Andre and standing next to him, you think, how did you make 154? He's a big middleweight now. Yeah, he is. He's a big middleweight now. And we saw him kind of look sluggish at the end, in the second half of the fight there. And there was some talk after the fight about maybe him being too tight at the weight and moving up to 168. So playing devil's advocate, Jason Quigley manages to survive what I expect to be a you know significant onslaught in the first three or four rounds. I think Andre approaches the fight similarly to to Williams without that kind of playground side to it. I do think he tries to go out and stick it on Quigley early. Can Quigley have the success? Is that if he's going to have the success? Is that where he has the success in the second half of the fight where Andre's not as fresh? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, and it's he's just got to try and keep that faith that that the second half of the fight will be will be more to his more to his liking. But I do think if you've got that kind of game plan, you've still got to try and make some kind of a dent in that first half. You've got to at least, or you won't get through it. Mm. You know, you've got to stand your ground to an extent. You don't necessarily want to, you don't end up fighting their fight and doing what they want you to do. But I think quite often you see fights where the narrative is that Tebbett's going to come into it in the second half you still got to do something in the first half because otherwise what a clever fighter might do in that situation is think, okay, I could go crazy here and win these first six rounds, massive 10 nines. It's going to be difficult to take you out because you're not really trying to do much. So rather than do that, I can just win these rounds without really doing a lot. Mm. You know, Carl Frampton did it against Scott Quigg, for example. It's just, I can just win these rounds without really doing a lot. And then you get into the second half of the fight uh, and you're behind and they've still got a full tank. And then you've got, and then and then you're in trouble then. So it's, it's it'll be interesting to see how they go about it. Um, and I always think with that kind of game plan too, it's, you've got to rely on a lot of kind of mental strength from your fighter and belief in the plan that that it can work. Because otherwise... They just spend quite a lot of time in the gym or a good few weeks being told, basically, the first half of the fight is going to be really hard, hard and it yeah. won't go your way. And I think you've got to be you've got to be very resilient and resolute to be able to just take that on board for what it is, which is this is part of the plan. 
and this is why it can work rather than that just getting into your head and then becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy because maybe Andre won't start all that quick maybe he won't be quite at it that night and if he's not you've got to react got to a, that yeah, yeah. you can't just think oh well, no this is what we plan to do so this is what we'll do mm. and particularly somebody like Jason Quigley as well who's had tremendous success as an amateur as well yeah. early in the fight is going to be where he's at his best as well yeah. so it is difficult you make a good point that final one prediction time Demetrius Andrade versus Jason Quigley I think Andrade I think Andrade and I think Andrade by sort of latest stoppage maybe the 10th hmm. I think Andrade if he doesn't stop him in the first half of the fight which I think he could then I think it's uh, Andrade decision shouldn't say it but I would love Jason Quigley to pull it off he is such a nice fella he's such yeah, a nice he's guy really and he has had he's had a you know, he's not had the best of times as a professional. You alluded to it there, kind of being not not cast aside on the West Coast. He's still had a very good deal with Golden Boy, but, you know, it hasn't been all plain sailing for him as a professional. Um, it would be lovely to see him to upset the apple cart and, and become world champion. But, yeah, I think it's difficult to see past Demetrius Andrade. Agreed. Agreed. So that's it. That's all we've got time for on episode 30 of the Boxing Social Podcast. As always, thank you to Andy Clark for joining me and to you at home or sat behind your phone or your laptop for joining us as well. Thanks very much and we'll catch up with you soon.